Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you've been well. I'm here with my buddy Mike Glover out in Colorado for a little visit, uh, doing some personal stuff. And we're gonna do some shooting today, some precision rifle stuff. So that'll be on the channel. It's probably actually already on the channel. So if you're interested in long range shooting and some tips with Mike, he's a former uh, Green Beret sniper and instructor for a while as well. So he knows his stuff way more than I do. If you're interested in that video, check it out. Uh, I'll let Mike talk about himself a little bit. He's been on the channel a couple times in the past. I'm on his podcast every once in a while. He has a really great podcast, Fieldcraft Survival. And we were talking, we were just sitting around talking for like, I don't know, two hours probably, <laughs> just about life, business, preps, everything. Mike's one of my favorite guys that I've run into in this, in this crazy YouTube world. He has his Ram 2500 with him today, which is a, a rig that I'd like to get into eventually. But I'm gonna let Mike talk a little bit about himself, kind of what he does, why he built the rig, and then we'll get into some specifics like typically happens on these walk-arounds. So Mike? Cool, thanks for having me. Uh, beautiful area in Colorado. Uh, good time for me to get away from the office and have some fun. And not just all business stuff, but personal stuff as well, which means just a, a good time. And so we did the long gun stuff, but also uh, as I drove up here, I drove in my 08 6.7 liter Dodge Ram diesel. And you guys might, if you guys follow me and listen to my podcast, it's on the Go Rig Challenge, which is a challenge basically where I traveled from Arizona, northern Arizona, all the way to the Canadian border on one tick of gas, no external support, no resources, which would kind of replicate what you would see in a bug out situation maybe a natural or man-made catastrophe moving from one area, uh, in this case, to a cross-border situation into Canada to get away from this, the bad situation. So what's the range you got roughly on like a full load, fully fueled in both your tanks? Like what kind of range can you expect to get? So full load, which is over 110 gallons, you're looking at over 2,000 miles. 2,000 miles. 2,000 miles Ooh. of one tank of gas. And, it's about 1,600 miles to the Canadian border, and I was able to basically get to the Canadian border and about halfway back before having to stop and get gas. Cool. Yeah, total. Cool, so, so Fieldcraft Survival. Mike runs a, a company, Fieldcraft Survival. They have a podcast. He does trainings as well. They sell some products. We'll, we'll actually see a couple of the products they sell in here. But he's if you're, if you're a fan of my channel, which probably a lot of you are watching this video, Mike, I was talking about is the kind of the other brand, the person that aligns most with what I do. We do some gun stuff, so, some training stuff, some survival stuff, some some bug out rig type stuff, and we try to enjoy what we do. So we try to put our hobbies around our preparedness. Anyway, so Fieldcraft Survival. If you if you like what I do, definitely check out what they do because it's a lot of similar stuff. We'll probably do a podcast actually while he's out if we have time for it. So I'll link to all that stuff down below, but let's get into the truck. Um, Ram 2500, you said it was an 08? Yeah, it's an 08 6.7. And you know, they basically made uh, the 5.9 Cummins diesel pickup truck, which is a very good and reliable, known as being the most reliable Cummins diesel. And then the 6.7, they I believe they started making after uh, 2007. And this is the 2007.5, which is an 08 uh, version of it. Um, it's just highly modified as far as like suspension and upgrades, but it doesn't look like it is. We, you know, it doesn't look like a, the California, they call them F boys, which is a bad word um, in California because they have souped up trucks. Everything that I built on this truck was for utility and purpose and nothing really was an aesthetic consideration. And uh, like you'll see on one side of it, I had a cow in Texas ram the side of my my truck and i just kept it that way because it's like it's not a show truck it's a work truck it's a bug out truck good stuff um so we're gonna just talk about some of the modifications he's done to the truck uh as we remember we'll talk about why particular modifications were done versus other stuff but yeah let's get into it awesome all right, we'll start up front. Phillips rig's actually over here too, but he's too lazy to film us right now, so we're on a tripod. Tell us about, 
<laughs> Tell us about what you got going on up here. You got a big meaty bumper, some lights, winch. Yeah, so the front end of this is basically what a Coloradoan would recognize or somebody who lives in rural America would recognize as the front end of a, a pickup truck. Um, I do this all as a standard, but if I am building a go rig or a off-road vehicle, I'm putting a steel loop on the vehicle. This is a Fab Fours bumper. Uh, no affiliation with the uh, Fab Fours as a business. It's just a good steel bumper, super heavy, but with the payload capacity being 4,000 pounds on this on this rig, uh, it doesn't show a sign of uh, bogging it down at all. But I chose the steel loop because it's going to protect the radiator support, especially with being an eight-inch lifted truck on 37s. You obviously run the risk. I mean, I'm, this is leg level for a huge bull elk that would send it catastrophically into the radiator support beam and completely ruin my day. I've seen it happen on back roads in Colorado. I've literally seen it happen, um, hitting a white-tailed deer, for example, and just completely destroying the vehicle. So went with the loop, went with a light bar up front. This is a rigid light bar. Um, you know, if you're running the back roads of any rural environment, you wanna be able to see. So that extra support and lighting is important. And then obviously I got a worn winch on here. Not many people run winches on the front of these size vehicles because uh, typically you're not gonna put yourself in a bad predicament, but this is a four wheel drive. And I've probably used that winch more times to recover, recover other people than I have myself, but I have used it to recover myself. Um, I actually got stuck in the salt flats of Utah uh -oh. in this truck because of the weight. Um, you can imagine this is an extremely heavy vehicle and I got a synthetic line and a factory 55 for self recovery uh, adapter on it. But yeah, uh, just a beefy front end. Being that this is kind of Mike's bug out rig, he did want to build it, overbuild it, I guess, because if he's bugging out and you actually do run into a deer, an elk or a moose or whatever, you want to be able to continue on your 2000 mile journey to wherever you're going. So good option for him. It's not really just necessarily built as a weekend warrior rig, but it's, it's a little more purpose built in that regard. Yeah, I, I lived in Colorado. Um, for many years in Monument and in uh, Durango and always lived off a dirt, dirt road in the back of National Forest. And so I've, I've even used this to prop up for different things. I've used it also as a cattle guard. I've had um, in and around ranches, I've had horses. And so if you work around cattle, if you work around any kind of livestock, um, having this is a standard SOP. But I think if you have, if you're in the option of running this versus not running it, the, the poundage on a big, uh, 2500 3500 i think it's a, a great option to beef up the front end of your of your rig cool and mike actually has a bunch of rigs so if you're into like different off-road vehicles mike's got mike's got a few and he's worth following so we'll come along to the side of the truck and talk wheels suspension whatever else we got going on cool so alongside here it's a pretty pretty tall vehicle i'm 510 or so and basically right in line with the rearview mirror. How tall are you? 6'1". Six, 6'1"? One. Six, one? All right, Mike's a pretty big guy. He's a big, he's one of those big Koreans. So we said, you said you're on 37 inch Falcon, looks like the Wild Peak AT3Ws. That's what I have on my truck, actually. Yep. You like so, them? Yeah, I, I chose this tire because, you know, if I'm like weighing the options of an MT versus an AT, then I, ratio wise, it's like, is it gonna be on the road versus off road? And this is gonna be on road more than it is off road, but with a consideration that you're gonna take it off road. And so honestly, man, I've ran a lot of tires, a lot of all terrains. This is my favorite all terrain tire. And it cuts down road road noise, being it's 37 by 12 and a half by 18s. These are 18 inch rims. Um, I also chose Raceline aluminum alloy wheels. There are some disadvantages of running aluminum alloy. Um, one, if you crack a bead or you crack the edge of the rim, it's harder to repair on the fly like a steel uh, rim, but it's super lightweight, which is a huge advantage and just a super efficient uh, rim. And so lightweight race line wheels, 37s, uh, all terrain on an eight inch pure performance lift. Pure performance is the name of the company and they do like Baja chase truck style stuff. I actually built this truck out originally probably about six years ago for the Baja 1000 um, because I was going I was chasing five bikes or I was chasing a team of five people on a bike um, and it wound up getting canceled, but I built it up for that intent. And so it's got a higher lift, obviously. 
Uh, one of the things to note is I have a uh, drop step down that's made by Amp Research. These aren't the most rugged, uh, but these aren't rock sliders. These are step ups. And the reason I like these is one, they illuminate when they drop down, but two, um, when they're tucked up, you can't get access to the rig. And there's not this big, you know, big piece of metal collecting all the rocks and debris that I'm typically running down on uh, back roads. And he was talking a little bit. Uh, he likes the the height of the lift, basically, and nothing to step up on without the doors opening, so that random passerbys really got to make an effort to kind of look up in here and see what's going on. So that's one advantage of having a really tall vehicle that. I never even thought of before. Yeah, I think when you're looking at everyday carry and truck gun considerations, like I wouldn't consider consider carrying an M4 and a Honda Civic. I mean, if I did, it would be somewhere very concealed because obviously you have real easy access to see and to get. Um, that's why I like truck gun, like I have a truck gun carbine in here where you don't have access to it. Even if you wanted to work this locking mechanism, it'd be difficult to do. You'd have to be on something to be able to work the locking to uh, mechanism to jig it out or, or do whatever you're gonna do, what criminals would do. Yeah, whatever they do. B and and uh, Mike, Mike lives in relatively rural Arizona, uh, so he's not like a city boy parking this downtown or anything like that. Mike's got a loadout kind of accordingly doing a, doing a road trip, but wanting to be prepared if anything went wrong. Uh, Mike, I forget if you talked earlier, Mike was in special forces for the u.s army for for 25 some odd years uh, and as a current firearms instructor as well so he's not just some joe schmo out there wanting to carry guns for fun uh because i'm sure i'll see that in the comment section uh, once we get inside um we'll continue going around the vehicle maybe talk about what you got going on back there bumper fuel tank stuff like that yeah let's do it cool all right, so we're around back of the truck. Uh, Ashley brought out some cookies. Sorry, I'm finishing up. We filmed some of this, but the battery died. So we're just gonna start from the beginning again. You tell us what you got going on back here. You got some insulation and stuff, um, the 75 gallon transfer flow tank. So some of this was built purposeful for your go rig challenge. All right, you take it away now. Well, so there's a couple options when you're looking at auxiliary tanks and you could tap into an auxiliary, which is obviously a reserve fuel component, or you could get your normal tank and replace it with a larger tank. I always recommend se separating it as an auxiliary. The reason being is like, this is an auxiliary 75 gallon tank. If I had that being full, that would give me obviously 75 gallons times 18 to 20 miles per gallon, depending on how fast I'm driving at 6.3 pounds per gallon, a lot of math, but the bottom line is I would have that reserve and it wouldn't compromise the function of the vehicle. Like let's say it broke down at my house, I still could tap into this tank. Now you could do that with a main tank, but it's just a little bit more problematic. I could hook this up at the filler neck and then pump it essentially out of the tank. So it's always a cool reserve. So that's the way I think about uh, go rig and uh, bugging out bug out vehicles now. It's like what do I have in reserve because that's the true capability of my bug out If I have a tenth of a tank you have a tenth tank capability to bug out whether that's 20 30 50 miles That's it. And so whatever your rig is it depends on that fuel source So I chose to go 75 gallons in the truck bed that's tapped into a automatic pump That fills up my main on the fly. Okay, um, and that, that gives me hundred and ten plus gallons on board at all times. And I, I typically keep this topped off, like it's not topped off now because uh, the pressure changes and uh, I'll fill it up on the way out of Colorado back to Arizona. Um, I also insulated the back end just because I was sleeping in it in the middle of winter and it's cheap to insulate the insides of these uh, truck beds. Um, and then I put plywood down as like a, a foundation for everything I was doing in it. Cool, and we got the, the soft top on here, which gives some protection from the weather, um, from prying eyes, makes it easier to load up some stuff uh, without people stealing it. But obviously people could get a knife in there and rip it out. So it's not necessarily a security thing as much as it is just kind of weather and visual protection. Yeah. Reduce it's your visual signature. It's, it's a cheap alternative too to a hard top. I mean, you're looking at a hard top, just stock. It's like two Gs mm -hmm. minimum. 
get lining, get electricity plugged into it, it get a better company, you're talking three, uh, even four grand. This best top, soft top on Amazon, I think a, a few hundred bucks. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's good enough to conceal it. Like you said, it's not cover, but it's concealment. Um, and but, easier to take off and store absolutely. if you need to use it. If yeah, you need yeah. To use truck bed. Yeah, I think that's one thing that people don't think about a lot in, in trucks. Like I see all these trucks with these high speed pull out components or drawer systems, and that's cool. If but they don't run anything on top, so you're losing a lot of capacity in between the top of the bed and however high your your truck cab is. Some of the ARE or whatever larger cabs go all the way up, and then you could store a whole bunch of stuff and extra stuff in it. Um, so yeah, I went with a soft top, just a te- cheaper alternative. Yeah, cool. And then we got some gear here. It looks like you got like a like a bug out bag, kind of loaded up. And we got some guns. We're gonna go shooting. I, I mentioned it earlier, but Mike brought some long range guns out, which we'll get to actually in a second video. And yeah, anything else going on back here? No, I, you know, the state, like I just put, this is what I carry in the back of my truck and it's typically a med uh, bag, which has an increased uh, signature of med. I mean, just more stuff for more people and uh, more, more likelihood that you're gonna run into maybe a, a potential bad situation. This is like the minimum staple of survival for me for a, a platform, for a vehicle. You have to carry med and not just enough for yourself, but enough for everybody in your vehicle. And if you're like me, thinking consciously about, I don't know, people I trail with, then I'm thinking about mass casualty. So it's just a little bit more robust med package. Like I say, if you carry a tourniquet on your person, uh, then I want my rig to be an ambulance. I wanna have combat lifesaver bags, cause you have the storage, why not carry it and be trained to do it. And then I have a gun bag that has just gun stuff in it. And then I always carry this tier tactical. This is the jungle pack, which is one of my favorite rucksacks. It's, it's the same Alice pack design that I used in the army, which is one of the best designs. It's, I mean, it's not an American design. It's a, it's actually a European design. Um, but basically a, a hard framed rucksack that has everything that I need to live out of displaced from this vehicle. So if I'm in rural Colorado, break down in the middle of nowhere, then I could move on foot with that rucksack, um, sleep in a sleeping bag, protect my core body temperature, eat enough chow, drink enough water to get at least three days away from this rig and potentially save my own butt. So uh, also use as a hunting pack as well. Let's uh, go inside the truck and see what we got going on there. All right, so Mike hopped in the back here. They actually sell this panel. Walk us through this uh, back panel here. So this is a panel pack. Um, probably about 15, 20 years ago, it's been a long time. Um, I treated a casualty, a guy, a buddy of mine who actually wound up passing away, but I treated him on the road with a Molly panel that was on the back of my Jeep, which I still own, a 99 Sahara. And that Jeep Molly panel, which is common in vehicles, gives you access to your gear. But if I needed like a med pouch that was Molly attached, Molly is adhering it to the back of the panel and I can't access it, so I had to unzip it and then grab the contents and then run to the casualty, which is problematic, especially when you're trying to remain organized and treating a casualty. So I designed like a pack that one can be converted into a backpack, as you can see here, flat pack, minimalist backpack. It's nothing sexy, but it's just, uh, you could put it on your back and carry it. So one of the advantages of that is if you have a full kit loadout and you don't want to build a second bug out bag or get home bag or whatever, you have it all there on the panel for easy access, but then you just pull it off and throw it on your back. Yeah, I think economically, you know, most people don't create different versions of kit for specific purposes. We do that because it's kind of like our lifestyle, but most people don't. So the idea is if I have survival and med in my backpack, in my, my panel to access, then I could still take that camping, I could take it hiking, and it's all, pur- it's like multi-purpose. And so this version of it, which is the older version of it, for example, um, has survival, med at the bottom, and then this rolls up and then just attaches here. I have an extra um, M4 mag. Um, I run a Triarch M4 in this truck, typically, because I'm in rural environments. When you're in rural areas, I mean, you, you could be you know, somewhere in the middle of Colorado where you can't see, or where you can see for, for miles. And so you're not gonna be in close confines and everybody in back of uh, the country in Colorado in rural environments has guns. Um, so yeah, so having this, uh, this straps around basically the back of the seat and it sits like this 
and then you could basically unroll it and then flop this up and then bug out with it if you have to. But everything that's on here is made of Velcro, so you could take this and go, this is my med pack, I run to the casually treat them, or hey, let's take our survival pack, boom, put it inside your backpack, and then I could take survival on the go. Real simple stuff. Cool. Yeah, interesting. There's there's a lot of panels out there on the market these days, but this one's got some unique features that kind of set it apart with the Velcro and the whole backpack aspect. You know, I got I got this idea actually uh, where I actually made it when I was a government contractor because if this is like this is a camouflage seat cover, but if this was black, for example, and you're in a normal car and this was strapped in a black backpack, which we offer as an option, and you looked inside here, it wouldn't be like there's a Molly panel full of Molly stuff that's jackpot. And so when I was a contractor, you would have looky loos at like checkpoints that would look inside your vehicle. And so we used to take backpacks, strap them to the headrest, strap them to the bottom of the, uh, of the seat rest, and then put something like this, a shemag, and then drape it over like this, which I do on all my vehicles. I, I straight uh, put shemags over here. So now when you see this, it looks at first glance, obviously like it's integrated into the seat and it doesn't look like a honey, you know, jackpot for somebody who's trying to jack stuff. Um, reducing your signature a little bit. That's one of the ideas. Well, the front, I got, I got a visor panel. Um, yeah, that's I cool. do have, like this is oh. the new one I just I put up because I gave you my old one. Um, but this is Pull our it. new, yeah, <laughs> your new, uh, uh, the new visor panel. It's just, look, none of this stuff is like sexy. This isn't the cry version of, of survival equipment. It's real basic, real simple, made in America. Uh, I use a local company to uh, provide this textile. But basically a Velcro panel that goes on the visor because if you need access to med equipment and it's traumatic, you want access now. And so having a med, back, um, a med pack in the back of the truck isn't gonna be good enough. You need it ready access. And so this side, you would put your tourniquet and this side you would fold it in here and then strap it here so you have a little pull tab to be able to rip this away and get access to your tourniquet. And then this side is our basic hemorrhage response kit, which is a North American Rescue field craft kit that you would put in here. You take this so you have quick access this way, and then you would put this on the visor so you have access to all your med stuff. So if I'm running into a casualty, I rip the whole thing off, I got my med pack for stop the bleed, or if I wanna address it myself, I could individually take what I need to. So, real simple. Cool, and last, but not least, let's talk a little bit about modifications you've done as far as what you got going on under the hood, accessories. Yeah, I, one of the main things that you would know about a diesel is most of them are restricted because of the emissions. And some places that's a problem where I live in the uh, wonderful county of Yavapai County in Arizona, Northern Arizona, I don't have emissions. And so I have an EGR delete, which deletes basically the emission system. I have a block plate and then I have a full exhaust. Uh, so no, it's not going through any kind of system that regulates uh, the emissions. Um, also, in addition to that, I have an EFI Live, which is the name of the company tuner. That's dyno tuned basically off of a five program, including economy and then obviously max horsepower and torque. And the advantage to that is on the fly, I could turn out the dial and get more fuel economy versus if I need more power and torque where I'm at, like in the hills of Colorado, like I could dial it up. Or towing Or towing, exa yeah. exactly. In fact, towing is all the way dialed down. And then I have a Switch Pro that's tied into all my lights, integrated into my lights. It's important to have like an organized system of running lights. I have uh, rock lights that are embedded into the, the wheel wells to be able to see obstacles around me. I have uh, front and rear uh, lights, and I have an air compressor that's hooked up to a switch as well. And so, in addition to that, I got the overhead uh, interface that's for the transfer flow tank that gives me the percentage of fuel in my main and my auxiliary. And then on the fly, I could adjust how much fuel I want in each specific one, and then catalog uh, digitally all my uh, miles, miles per gallon, etc. on the fly. So truly like a, a little cockpit of uh, capability. Cool, man. Makes you want a big, beastly strong diesel truck. <laughs> Bug out rig. Um, I don't know. I think that's it. We got to get to shooting. So thanks for your time, yeah. Mike. Uh, I'll put all his links down below. Fieldcraft Survival. You could just Google it really and find everything you're looking for. Uh, Mike does a variety of training 
has uh, been getting into some webinar stuff. So he does in-person training, but he's actually trying to make information available to more people. So he's doing a lot of stuff online. So stay tuned for, we've been chatting about kind of some of the future stuff he's got coming up, which sounds exciting. Um, but anyways, Mike, great guy. One of my favorite guys in the, uh, in the tactical space. Uh, and kind of, I, I try to model my life after Mike, try to be just like him. Gain 50 more pounds and he'll be there. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Mike, cool guy. Check him out. Thanks for your time. Um, probably, like I mentioned earlier, we've done some precision rifle videos. I'm guessing that I'm going to release before this video. So check those out. And until next time, guys, take care. Thanks, guys.